right, we were talking about um, books, Book to books, to books, to books to film adaptations. Books to film adaptations. Stuff. Yeah. Um, we started with the the Stephen King. Stephen King. Shining. Kubrick. Arguable travesty. K- K- Kubrick ruins pretty much everything he touches, though. <laughs> I don't think that's true. I, c- I don't know. I quite, you, you, I, yeah, you but I've got a soft spot for like. Um, you said you full like metal full metal jacket. I do yeah. like full metal jacket. I, I, I confess I've only watched that a handful of times. And it's probably when I was too young to it's, actually get it. Yeah, it's it's not the best Vietnam film ever, without a doubt. I tend not to like Vietnam films in general. You've got to love Platoon. You've got to love Platoon. I get it. Platoon well, just, is amazing. The, the reason I don't. Especially I'm, from the fact that the guy that directed it and wrote it. Um, We're doing the name thing again. Yeah, I can't remember people's oh, names. She is so famous, <laughs> so famous. Um, him, anyway, the guy that directed was, Oliver Stone. That, I was, yeah. wrote and directed. It's about him. He was in Vietnam. He wrote it. Well, about if there's, his anyone, if there's anyone in Vietnam, so it's it's fucking good. Well, if there's End anyone, story. if there's anyone that's going to be able to tell a good story about a, any particular event, it's someone that's taken part in it. But at the same time, war films just tend to be kind of grueling. Well, yeah, it's not and like he, a laugh a minute. No, you know well, I mean? yeah. I mean, he's actually chuckling away when uh, Willem Dafoe gets shot to pieces. Yeah. Because if, you, have, if you haven't seen it, you know, oops. But if you haven't seen it, what the fuck have you been doing with your life? It's platoon. I, I tend to find those kind of things really depressing. And I, I, I like to watch films to be entertained. I mean, there's, there's certain things. Don't, don't watch The Thin Red Line then. Oh, I tried to watch that. I tried to watch that. <laughs> I was just. I couldn't. Oh, but it's a beautiful film. Not. Right? not not because it was grim, just because it was dull. Really? Yeah, I found I it love really his boring. Again, I can't remember his name, so I'm going to skirt around that. <laughs> but I love his directing. But go, but going back to uh, Stephen King adaptations. Oh yeah. Um, the only there's only a handful of Stephen King adaptations which I've actually really enjoyed. Um, the main one probably being The Mist. Yeah, I think that's hands <laughs> down. That's hands down yeah. the best. I mean, I'm, I'm a, you haven't read many. No. I'm a bit of a Stephen King fan, and the the books work, kind of, and they wouldn't work as films. Stephen King's biggest problem is the fact that he can't end a story. His short stories are great because they have like a, a one-shot little punchline thing, and that's why they made really good movies like Shawshank Redemption yeah, and Green which Mile. which I will say is the greatest film ever made, Shawshank Redemption. Again, yeah. <laughs> you, just, you just can't... You just want that on a t-shirt, don't you? Yeah. Or have it tattooed across <laughs> the chest. But but here I am here I am saying that I don't like watching depressing films and you can't really get much more depressing than The Mist really when you look at it. or the Shawshank Redemption or, which you've just no, said is the no. greatest film of all the Shawshank Redemption, oh, that's true, actually, the Shawshank yeah, Redemption yeah. is actually really upbeat okay I'll it's, take that back it's, yeah, it's so, about yeah. a guy that goes through hell and comes out squeaky clean at the end on a yeah. beach yeah <laughs> which is it, and he literally does that as well just yeah. crawls through a mile of shit and comes out clean uh, at the end, it's a metaphor for the entire film that, yeah I remember, but the, yeah, as you pointed out quite rightly about um, the Shining, Stanley Kubrick manages to completely undermine the entire point of the film, yeah, and the whole fact of the kid using the Shining to communicate with the janitor and save his family, which is why it was called the I Shining. I think in the book, I'm, I've been a while since I read it, but I'm sure the janitor comes up and saves them, and that's the point. Whereas, like in the film. He uses the shining. The janitor comes up, gets an axe in the chest, and it's like, well, and that was it. completely it's... fucking pointless. <laughs> it, 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 there was really no reason for him to be in the film except to say, "Oh, look, kid, you've got something called the shining." Um, yeah, I've yeah. given it a name. Well yeah. done, copyright. Um... <laughs> 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 I, I always think of the Simpsons episode. Yeah, with the, the shining. The shining. That's it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He also has that really, really awesome apartment with the big pictures of the naked women on the walls. And there's like a different one at each end of the room, so you're getting framed by a different woman each time they cut back and forth. <laughs> I missed this. I haven't seen it for a surprising for you, considering, you know, <laughs> slightly perverted. Do I have a reputation? <laughs> but I don't know. I mean, I, I like The Shining. I like The Shining novel. And I like Shining film, despite its discrepancies well, that you've just discovered. The, the, Sh- but, the Shining film had a lot of really iconic things in it. I mean, the the empty hotel itself with these cavernous rooms, which are really quite scary. 
when there's no one in them, like the big lobby and stuff. Yeah, it's beautifully filmed. And I also think that, I don't know, weirdly enough, it reminds me of Alien. Well, which is kind of, of creepy, strange. This yeah, creepy the, dread. yeah, the big empty house kind of syndrome that you get at the and beginning it, of Alien when the camera's walking around the corridors in the Nostromo and there's nothing. And you get that same echo in the shine when they're following the little kid round. Yeah, which the, is actually which wheel. is actually one of the uh the Which I'm sure is referenced in Aliens in the director's cut when you see the oh, when you see the kid on the uh, on the bike. I'm, yeah. I'm sure it's a reference. <laughs> it's gotta be. But um Come on, Brian. I'm not sure of the chronology there. I'm sure, The Shining predates Alien. Oh yeah, it does. Must be. I'm confident of that simply because the, you can tell from the grain of the footage. Um, That's the fact that yeah, Jack Nicholson looks really seventies <laughs> as well. But that uh, that bit in The Shining where the kid just turns a corner and suddenly comes face to face with the twins. Yeah. That is to me one of the scariest bits of film. Yeah, there's a beautiful, there's beautiful use of sound in that. It's as just well. that suddenly goes quiet. It was when the kid's going around, he's going over that mixture of surfaces mm. where he goes from the carpet yeah. to the, the linoleum or whatever and you get that... <laughs> <laughs> and it's just this brilliant use of sound in it. And I don't know why, that just kind of builds up this kind of well, the, the twins expectation. The, the twins bit. at the end of the corridor, I just felt was a really scary image, just the way they suddenly come face to face with them. And then, it, but at the same time, it's kind of then got something really cheap and cheesy, where an elevator full of blood. Yeah, <laughs> which, which I just thought was no, that's really not scary. That's, it's I mean, so what, one ridiculous. subtle, one's brick, and yeah, yeah. The and whole then, twins speaking in unison things, just anything with <laughs> anything with kid ghosts in is just fucking terrible. It's horrible. Uh, with little children. <laughs> <laughs> Which brings us to the um, the Alan Moore adaptations, I think. Now, I liked V for Vendetta. I've not seen it, You've but not then I've not seen the film. I haven't read it. Oh, well, I, I've I've not read the V for Vendetta graphic novel itself for the simple fact that I'm really kind of shallow when it comes to graphic novels, and if it's not pretty, I, I'm <laughs> I was going to say, look at yeah, I was about to start laying into and the whole Alan Moore graphic novel thing because I've got from Hell. And I've tried to read that like four or five times and I can't get past the fact that it looks like it's drawn by a five-year-old. Yeah. I can't get past that from being like it's... an artist and a visual person. Well, I mean, it's called it, a graphic it, novel yeah, for a reason. exactly. I feel like they're insulting you've, me. You've Sorry, got, I can't You've got to have the visuals that go with pretty. the text, otherwise it's not a graphic novel. Yeah. I mean, uh, He's written a novel that has some drawings in it. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, that's, that's not what I signed yeah. up for. But and I've tried numerous times to read Watchmen and can't. No, and I I have actually what read Watchmen and you actually I, made it through it. I I've made never it through made it through. It. It. It's the biggest waste of time ever. I, I know. I I'm going to go out on a limb and say it's shit. Watchmen is a terrible graphic novel. It's, it's awful. a chore to read. I don't understand why it is put on the pedestal it is. The movie, well, think, yeah, the movie is quality. It's brilliant. It might it it does have plot holes, granted. Yeah. Some pretty gaping ones, but it's just entertaining. The... And it gets better every time I watch it. Yeah. Which is rare, especially for films these days. Usually, especially in the last two years, <clears throat> you'll go see something at the cinema, come out absolutely blown away and think that was the greatest thing I've ever seen. And then a week later, it's completely forgotten mm. and I most likely won't buy it on DVD. There's been so many films like that recently. It's like, I feel like Hollywood's just gone like junk food. Well, it, Hollywood's all about bums on seats. Yeah. You, you make things as bland as and, and as accessible as humanly possible so you can get the biggest number of people into the cinema, which is why they always, which is why you don't get um, 80s style horror slasher films anymore with buckets of blood and gore. It's the major problem with general Hollywoodiness at the moment. So why we just in on end, endless with series the endless of repeats and, and re oh god I'm sequels. sick and tired of remakes the, uh, I'm sick and tired of remakes and the other thing which I loathe and despise are um, uh, origin stories yeah reboots of stuff yeah 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 anytime you see a franchise which is going to be a reboot especially with superheroes you just think no we're we heading have... for Spider Man here yeah <laughs> I can see it looming on the horizon you, I I mean, any, any time they say reboot you think oh no we're going to hear the same story again I mean the, 
someone pointed out to me that we're like sat here going, oh, Spider-Man, I can't believe they read that. Ten years ago, Spider-Man was made now, the original, with Tobey Maguire. Yeah. There are people who are going to go see that who weren't alive when that was made. Granted, I will say that. <laughs> this sounds a bit frightening. The, th- the thing that I really didn't like, though, was the fact that um, the reboot was announced only a few years after the travesty that was the third Spider-Man film. Well, you can't really blame them. I can see their argument for doing it. No, but it's just it should have been left fallow for a lot longer than it actually yeah. was. Um, but it's we're, uh, the reason I'm sick and tired of origin stories is the characters that they play around with, like Batman and stuff, they are legendary characters. They're right up there with the Greek gods and stuff. You already know who well, they are. Well, that's it. I mean, you know the origin. You don't need to spend another two hours telling people who they are. They're so ingrained into popular culture. I think Just that's get why. Get on with it and tell the story. I think we'll go in. We'll have a little look here at the the, the rules of trilogies here because this is where we're starting ahead with this. <laughs> because you, if you're doing a trilogy or whatever, your first film you've got to set everybody up. And you've got your your origin, as you as it were. That's why, on a whole, I think the second one tends to be better, because you've got all that out of the way. Everybody knows who everybody is, so you can just get on with the story yeah. and just get stuck in there. You haven't got any of the setting up crap to do. Uh, X Men's the prime example. But then, like when they get to the third one, it's just like, well, it's the end of the trilogy. Even, we don't have to worry anymore. Even X even X Men wasn't uh, the first the first X Men film wasn't really an origin story. All, the, so all the characters were in place. They already had their backgrounds and stuff. Um, you followed Wolverine through, and he was sort of a, um, he was used as a sort of a narrative tool to take you to take you through the universe. Wolverine as a tool. Wolverine. <laughs> tool Wolverine. <laughs> Phil says. <laughs> Phil says Wolverine's a tool. <laughs> He's a tool. But for telling uh, stories. What, what, what I'm saying was, I mean, uh, the actual Wolverine film was an origin story, and it was crap. I didn't mind it I, that much. I know. think you think you're right. I <laughs> think origin stories are just bum. Well, origin stories are okay if it's a character you don't know. But with Batman, for example, you don't need another origin story. With Superman, you do not need another origin didn't story. Didn't his parents get shot? Maybe. I didn't know that. I, I, I heard about that somewhere. Was I thought it, it was a rumour. When think... he was eight years old, yeah. his parents but get I mean, shot in an alleyway. Look at, look at the... There's 90... not a child alive who doesn't know that. Look at the 89 version of uh, Batman, the Tim Burton one. Yeah. Um, there isn't an origin story in that. His origin, no, true, his true. origin is covered in five, ten minutes, halfway through the film when Vicky Vale is following him around the place. Yeah, Vicky Vale finds out who he is. Yeah. For the audience, yeah. she does the job of the. She basically plays the audience in that. She's, so that's, she's her, uh, uh, the the audience is like doorway into the film. So with a character as famous as that, that's all you need. Mm. But they seem to be obsessed with these reboots where they. They go into detail about um, the, the origin stuff. We already know. Get on with the proper villains. And they always end with a cliffhanger saying, this is what we're doing next. No, I wanted to see that now. <laughs> oh, you've just got no patience. Just well, Batman, Batman Begins. You, you yourself said you didn't really like Batman Begins. I don't like Batman my Begins. Favorite, my favourite bit of Batman Begins is right at the end, where uh, Jim Gordon's going on about worrying about escalation. Saying, oh, yeah, that's hands down the best bit in the movie without a doubt. Yeah, it's, yeah, the two of them stood there next to Talking the about symbol or whatever, and, and the then they, and then they just... turn over the Joker card God. and he says, yeah, and I'll look it. into it. That's the best bit of the film, yeah. And I wanted that to be the entire film. That should have been the opening scene, yeah. <laughs> it shouldn't we, have bothered with any of the other stuff. We already know who Batman is, get on with it, get you're on with the villains. Wrong. Yeah, you're not wrong, not at all. <laughs> 